Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to the new year. I hope everyone had a fantastic holiday season and that this year brings you many, many joys and positive memories to experience. Today, we have a very special and fascinating podcast for you. I really want to get into it because it's full of a lot of tremendously interesting details about one of the most solemn and revered memorial institutions in the United States, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. For those of you who may not be aware of what the tomb is, it's the final resting place of three unknown United States soldiers from past wars, observing the sacrifices of all United States servicemen and women. The tomb is located at Arlington National Cemetery near Washington, D.C., and just celebrated its centennial in November 2021. In the past, you may have heard of the guards at the tomb, who are famous for their stoic demeanor, unable to acknowledge the public while guarding. They remain at their post despite the cold, heat, snow, and rain, and they also strive for perfection, down to the amount of lint, or lack thereof, on their uniforms. They come as close as one can possibly get to flawlessness and are the embodiment of discipline and composure. For the tomb guards, it's a 24-hour, 365 days a year post. That's right, they guard day and night, whatever the weather may be, like I said. They're always there walking them out of the tomb's plaza, 21 steps to denote the 21-gun salute given to military and foreign dignitaries to honor those who sacrifice everything for our freedoms. The guards didn't start serving at the tomb until 1925, assuming the rule recognized today in 1948. Guards can move on to become sentinels after intense, rigorous training to earn the honor that less than 700 have reached over its history, including five women, the most recent female earning the honor in 2021. My guest today, Sergeant First Class Alexander Deal, earned Tomb Guard Identification Badge number 678 back in 2020. He earned the badge in just five months, which is a rare feat for the honor. He went on to guard at the tomb for two years before officially moving on to the Army Marksmanship Unit in November of 2021. Staff Sergeant Deal had shot with the unit during the summer at the annual Camp Perry National Matches. There, he was an instructor on the firing line for the Small Arms Firing School, teaching others the fundamentals of marksmanship and also competed himself in some of the match's most prestigious events. Sergeant First Class Deal placed 23rd out of almost 840 competitors in the President's Rifle Match and earned the coveted President's Tab for placing within the top 100 competitors. Remarkably, he's the first Tomb Guard in history to earn the Tab. I sat down with Sergeant First Class Deal while he was at Camp Perry for the matches, and I mean physically sat down with him in person, which is the first and only time I've done that since this podcast began. He was a staff sergeant then, moving on to Sergeant First Class on December 1st, 2021. During our time together, I was able to talk with him about his experiences in the Army, his career in marksmanship, and, of course, the fascinating details of what it's like to be and what it takes to be a guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Sergeant First Class Deal has witnessed so many incredible things in his lifetime and has an enormous level of motivation and commitment that is truly admirable. It was such a thrill to be in his presence and listen to his experiences, and I know you'll enjoy hearing them as well. So stick around. You're going to want to hear this. Here's Sergeant First Class Alexander Deal, a real Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Honor Guard. Staff Sergeant Deal, thank you so much for doing this with us. I really appreciate it. Really been looking forward to this. I'm glad we're finally able to sit down and and go through this together. Um, so first off, before we get into everything, can you just tell me a little bit about your, your background? Where did you grow up and how did you become involved in the military? Sure. Uh, so I was born and raised in Columbus, Georgia, just outside of Fort Benning. Um, whenever I was 18, I got a scholarship, and, well, not a scholarship, but a uh, nomination and acceptance to West Point. I uh, was there for three years. Um, just due to academics and having a hard time keeping up there, I ended up uh, not finishing West Point. But in 2011, I enlisted back in the Army um, and spent the next five years at Fort Bragg. I was there with the 82nd Airborne, deployed with them in uh, 2013 and 14. And then in 2016, I came down on orders to uh, Fort Myer, where I was at the Old Guard, 3rd Infantry Regiment. And I've been there for the last uh, almost five years now, uh, the last two of which I've spent at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. That's excellent. So military in general, how did you, why did you become a member of the military? Was it running your family or is it yes. something? Okay. So I was uh, adopted and raised by my uh, great-grandparents. My great-grandfather was a Korean War vet and uh, 
yeah, I was just kind of always around it. Obviously, being uh, at Fort Benning there, just outside of Fort Benning, there's a, a big military presence. So it was something I was exposed to from a, a very young age and something I was always interested in, just part family tradition and uh, other part just, I don't know, I, I really just felt compelled to do it um, and seemed like a, uh, a lifestyle that I could get behind the structure, the discipline things like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so you are the assistant sergeant of the guard of the tomb of the unknown soldier. Correct. Um, what does that role entail and how did you get into that? So the assistant sergeant of the guard is, um, it's kind of a continuity role there at the tomb of the unknown soldier. It's, uh, the, uh, more official title to that is operations, uh, non-commissioned officer. So I handle a lot of the, uh, administrative, uh, responsibilities within the, uh, the organization there as far as uh, training, um, logistics and supply, and then, like I said, just a general continuity piece throughout the organization. It's uh, the only position in the platoon that we don't typically recruit from outside the fill. It's filled from within. Um, so we use one of our more senior uh, non-commissioned officers as well as uh, fully qualified sentinels, uh, an individual who's already passed training to fill that role because they understand the job, they understand what they need, so they can communicate with these people. And then it also serves the role as being the most senior, fully qualified individual. If we get a new sergeant of the guard or commander of the guard, that's who's responsible for training them as they come into the organization. Great. Can you uh, explain a little bit the the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and and the guards and what they do and the importance of, of their roles? Oh, absolutely. So uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, uh, it's a 24 hour, 365 days uh, guard post uh, for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So it was created in, uh, or established in 1921. Uh, the World War I unknown was interred in uh, 11 November 1921. So obviously being that it's 2021, we're coming up on the centennial of the internment of the World War I unknown. Um, the guards themselves didn't start until uh, 1925, and then the old guard as we know it now uh, took over the right to guard the unknown uh, in 1948. So since that time, uh, the 3rd Infantry Regiment has been responsible for guarding the unknown or unknowns uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, the training process, uh, or the tomb as we know it now with the guards as we know them, uh, that officially began in uh, 19, 7 February 1958, when, when the first badge was awarded uh, to Master Sergeant William Daniel. Uh, and then from there, we've had 690, I think just the other day we got confirmation that we had a new one passed, and we're around 690 uh, fully qualified Sentinels since the creation of the tomb. Um, for them to go through training and become fully qualified, it's... Uh, a triple volunteer process is kind of how it, is how it starts. So they volunteer for the Army. Uh, they volunteer for service at uh, the 3rd Infantry Regiment. And then from there, they volunteer to come and try out for the tomb. Um, that process then begins with a roughly three-week evaluation period to where we identify whether or not they are capable of being trained uh, to our standard. Uh, if they pass that three-week evaluation period, then they actually begin their training. And that training can take anywhere from, on average, about eight to nine months. Some people have finished it as quick as uh, five or six. Uh, others, it can take them up to a year. Uh, and through that one year, up to one year process, um, they go through a series of four tests uh, that get incrementally harder as they go along. The final test being uh, the badge test. Um, and during that test, they're evaluated on their uniforms. Uh, they're allowed two deficiencies on that uniform. Something like a visible piece of lint would be a deficiency. Um, so obviously, you can quickly get to two deficiencies very easily. Uh, and then outside performance, so conducting a guard change, um, they're allowed two deficiencies on that as well. And then they have a knowledge portion. So in the test previous to the last one, they've had 17 pages of knowledge that they've been required to memorize verbatim. Uh, encompasses everything from history about Arlington, uh, history about the tomb itself, the unknowns, uh, the guards, and then also key uh, personnel throughout all of uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Um, And then the final test is a brief. They give a history brief about uh, everything that they've learned, and it's a go, no no-go event. If they put out any incorrect information, it's an automatic uh, event failure. 
Um, so the testing criteria just to make it through training is, is very difficult. And then from there, they will continue to serve at the tomb for at least a year from the time that they've completed training. Wow, that's incredible. Um, but a very important role that uh, many seek out to do, sounds like. Yeah, my current role, I don't change the guard or, or walk the mat as much as I used to. I still do it. I'm still qualified to do it. Uh, one of my functions is I serve to help backfill one of our three reliefs. So we have three uh, reliefs that are on a, on a rotation, essentially a, a firefighter schedule type of a situation that goes on there. Um, and me, the commander of the guard, the sergeant of the guard, as, as long as they're all qualified, um, are able to backfill them. If they have personnel that want to go to a school or training or some other thing comes up, family things, um, we, we serve that function as well. But um, what a lot of people don't realize is throughout the testing process, they, the individuals who are going through training go through training essentially in view of the public. Like we don't hide them away and then they are qualified and then they go outside. Um, during the early parts of training, that's somewhat the case. Um, but once they get to a certain point, before they've even passed their first test, they're out there conducting guard changes, guarding the unknowns in view of the public. Um, and then their tests are conducted in view of the public. So it's not something that's done behind closed doors. It's, it's something that's done live. Mm -hmm. Wow. I guess there's only one way to exactly. actually train yeah. that. <laughs> that's really, really neat. So when you are a guard, what is your daily routine like? Um, so without getting into any operational uh, details, um, they report earlier than the majority of the United States military does. And then from there, they'll be on a 26-hour uh, shift. Uh, while on shift, they have resources to fully sustain them for that period. We have a kitchen, we have a bathroom, uh, we have bunk areas. Uh, and then the hub of uh, the workspace is the ready room. So once they come on shift, they get their uniforms ready and displayed. They get their uh, ready racks set up. That's an area to where they can uh, get ready pr just prior to a guard change. Uh, so during the summer, the guards are uh, changed out every 30 minutes, and then in the winter, they're changed out every hour. Um, 15 minutes prior to a guard change, uh, the entire uh, relief is notified that, hey, we're 15 minutes out, all of their work stops, and they start prioritizing uh, the NCO who will be going out to change the guard, and then the, uh, the guard that's going to go out to replace the one that's already out there. They'll start getting them dr uh, dressed up. Uh, checking them for any minor deficiencies that might have been missed. And then once time hits, they go out the door, conduct the guard change, and come back down. And that's during the hours of operation of the cemetery. So from 08 to uh, 1700 in the afternoon, that's the focus, is going out there, changing the guard, conducting wreath ceremonies as they're scheduled, uh, occasionally providing uh, history briefs and tours, obviously with COVID, that's changed a little bit on how often or, or how we're able to do those. Um, but interacting with the public, telling them the story of the unknowns of Arlington, why it's important, why do we do what we do. Um, and then they do that until the cemetery closes. As soon as the cemetery closes, their immediate priority is getting all the uniform items that they wore that day back up to the same level of expectation for the next day. Um, not the very next day because their, their next day is a, a recovery day and then they go into another work day. Um, so they can sleep, they can eat, they can do whatever they need to do throughout the night to include training time um, because obviously we can't train on the plaza during the day in view of the public. So that's something that happens at night. Um, so between training, eating, showering, physical fitness, uh, uniform maintenance, the, that's what they do throughout the night. Um, and then they still have to guard as well. We have guards that go out there uh, every hour usually uh, at night, but the, the plaza is continuously guarded all through the night, every single day. Um, so in between guard shift, working on whatever they're working on, um, they're, they get sleep as they're able to, um, usually three, four hours at a stretch here and there, other naps along the way. So it's not like they're up continuously the entire night all the time. Uh, and then they go into a recovery day, where again, like I said, they, they have more time to rest, refit for the next work day that they have. And then they keep on, uh, like I said, without getting into too many details, but they go on their rotation uh, and they have uh, days off built into that rotation as opposed to just the in-between days. So there are uh, essentially three or four day breaks throughout the rotation. Wow, that's that's incredible. It's, it's just It's interesting to me to think about 
this is like a nine to five kind of job. You know, it, it's such a prestigious sort of title, yet you're, you know, it's just a, it's a job, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, br- I broke it down as close as I could to uh, actually do the do the math on it one day. And on average, and this average is a little on the light side um, of a sentinel, regardless of whether they're in train or a tomb guard or a sentinel. Tomb guard being uh, what we refer to all of us collectively, sentinel being those individuals that have uh, earned their badge and finished training. Um, on average, we spend about 107 hours in a typical like nine to five, seven day week, but we don't work that schedule. Um, but if we broke it down to something close to that, about 107 hours worth of time spent actually doing the job and then being, or the time that goes into being ready to do the job. Right. That's incredible. Um, so a lot of time involved with it. Absolutely. The easiest way I can put it into perspective, if you understand how smartphones work these days, like a lot of us have had our Google or Siri, whatever, try to change our home location to the tomb. That's how much time is put into mission readiness there. Wow. So it doesn't leave much time for for uh, your own free time and that kind of thing, or or do you still get a pretty good balance of that? There, there, we do a really good job down there, I think, uh, about managing that we understand how much time it takes to do the job but we do a fair amount of balancing like i said between headquarters always being on standby to cover down it's not just a we wait for that to happen we rotate our personnel we get them on leave we we get them to schools they want to go to other opportunities that they want to explore no different than how i've been able to participate this whole summer with uh, being a summer shooter for amu people have been at like my my coworkers, my fellow tomb guards have been able to help give me the opportunity to do that. So we, we definitely try our best to take care of our personnel down there to make sure that there is that balance. That's excellent. Um, so when you are a guard, you said that you, um, you're you out there, you can interact with the, the people there and answer their questions and things like that. When you're not doing that, what sort of things are going through your mind? Do you you know think about the TV show you just watched or you know, are you, does, it, does the impact of the job, is that always in the back of your mind? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's always there. And just to make sure that I was clear on it. While they're on the plaza, they're not interacting with they the are public. Not. No, no, no. When they're actually posted, when they're guarding, when they're conducting the changes in the guard, or if you see us in uniform, yes. glasses on, all that, no, we, we are tomb guards. We are sentinels. There's no breaks in ceremonial composure. We're there to do one thing and one thing only, and that's uh, guard the unknowns. Um, however, throughout the duty day, we're not always out there, and it does provide us opportunities to go out and engage with the public. Uh, sometimes they come down to quarters on scheduled tours. Other times we just go outside and interact with them willingly to, like I said, continue to tell the story of the unknowns and why that's important. Um, but yes, uh, it's always, for me personally, it is always kind of in the back of the mind. Um, granted, I have not personally walked them out a whole lot. I came as a relatively senior uh, staff sergeant to the organization. Uh, and my initial role as a relief commander um, didn't really afford me the opportunity to get out and walk the mat too much. That wasn't my primary job. Um, my primary job was to run the relief, make sure everything was coordinated properly, and then go out and conduct the guard change, conduct the weapons inspection, things like that. Um, but even while doing that throughout a work day, um, that, that's all you're really focused on is making sure that the mission's done, the soldiers are out at their highest state of readiness, that they're going out there. Um, at the highest level of proficiency possible, every single guard change. Um, for the walkers uh, on the mat, yeah, you, you, there, there's definitely times where they, they get out there and they're not necessarily zoning out per se, but they are thinking about other things. Um, but the impact of what they're doing and why they do it is always there if you talk to any one of them. Uh, it's never something that goes away. Um, there are these brief moments in between guard changes, especially during the winter, the crowds thin out a lot more to where uh, the entire plaza is empty aside from the, the guard who's out there. And then that's the, the, those are those periods of time where uh, we typically might get a little bit more introspective and we're thinking about maybe things going on in our own life or just looking out over Arlington and thinking about the impact of that. Um, but then the crowds start showing back up just prior to the guard change and it always kind of brings you back into that primary focus of what you're doing um, and why the people are there. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, are there any particular experiences or anything like that, that that sticks out in your mind that hold a special place for you? 
I'm actually really glad you asked that. So whenever I get to interact with uh, people about being a tomb guard or uh, about the tomb in general, that's something I encourage a lot of people. If they ever have the opportunity or they meet a tomb guard randomly, I actually encourage them to ask that question because it's very different for all of us. Um, I know for some of the walkers, uh, some of their most impactful moments have just been those days where, for whatever reason, the cemetery is perfectly quiet, whether it's a, a really bad snowstorm that goes through D.C. and shuts down um, foot traffic to where it's just us out there all day long. Like They have these really profound moments doing that. Uh, for me, it was, uh, so as a relief commander, and also right now, I one of my primary jobs, at least ceremonially speaking, is conducting wreath ceremonies. So after a guard change, there's a block of time dedicated for personnel to come and lay wreaths to honor the unknowns. Um, so after we do the guard change, we go down, we grab the wreath, we bring it back out, and then me as the host, I walk up to the top of the stairs there in front of the tomb, greet the group, um, go through the sequence of events one more time for them so they're not nervous, and then we go conduct the wreath, and then uh, we walk off. Um, the one that sticks out most in my mind is I, so like I mentioned previously, I was in the 82nd Airborne, I was with the uh, 2nd Battalion uh, 508 Parachute Infantry Regiment, and I got to the top of the stairs one day for a wreath group, and there was a Looked like it was a family. There was a young girl in the uh, group of four that I was talking to, and she happened to be wearing a unit crest um, from um, my exact parachute infantry regiment, the 508. So I talked to her and asked her, I was like, so if you don't mind me asking, where did you get that? Um, do you know what that is? And she mentioned that they had just finished uh, their grandfather's funeral service in Arlington, and they were also scheduling that day to come and lay a wreath. Um, and that was definitely, for me, a very, very profound moment because I was very fond of my experiences in the uh, 82nd, had a lot of really good friends there, um, and especially in the 508. And then to meet somebody like that who had had uh, the kind of day that she had had uh, and to understand what what it meant for them to not just be in Arlington, but to be at the tomb. They're, it's arguably the... I don't mean, argue, but it was the primary reason the tomb was established was to be a focal point for people to come and grieve, um, whether it was someone who never came home or just somebody who had died and been buried somewhere else and now their family maybe lives closer to Arlington. Um, that's the whole point of the tomb is it is a focal point that represents uh, our military, um, not just the Army, but the military at large and our fallen service members. Um, so for that day for me, that was by far one of the most profound days easily and then second to that is any time we have the opportunity to uh, host an honor flight um, so honor flight being where a state organization gets together and um, gives veterans from all wars an opportunity to come to dc tour around the capital and every time they come they also stop by the tomb of the unknown soldier they'll typically lay a wreath so whenever we're, we're conducting a guard change you'll come outside and you'll just see sometimes hundreds of these uh veterans from all the way back as far as World War II uh, coming and showing their respects and without fail, uh, especially if they're able to lay a wreath there, you get to the point in the ceremony where taps is played once we're there at centers and we're physically uh, just laid the wreath and you see all of these veterans, um, oftentimes some of them in wheelchairs, and oftentimes some of them audibly fighting off their caretakers so that they can stand to their feet. Uh, render a hand salute or place their hand over their heart, uh, oftentimes tears in their eyes. And those moments as well kind of, it shows you that the tomb is not just a place. It's not just a object. It, it's a lot more profound than that. It still has uh, a lot of significance for people today, even though it was created way back in 1921. Like it still holds that same level of significance for a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. What an incredible thing to be such part of such a powerful powerful place that really humanizes it to to actually see see those who understand its meaning firsthand. Um incredible. I'm I'm surprised you don't get emotional. I'm getting emotional right now. I don't know how you're not. Um so what happens when you're no longer a guard or do you even have any sort of special benefits you have or any any commemorative items or, or how does that work? Um yes and no. Um so at least as tomb guards, so one of the things about training, if you see a tomb guard out there doing their job, um, every single item you see that tomb guard wearing and even carrying with the rifle, uh, that tomb guard has 
either heavily modified or built from scratch. Um, like those stocks on the rifles, that tomb guard hand sanded and polyurethane that stock to make it look that way. Same thing with the grips on the bayonet. Um, all of us take uh, our care on actually servicing the, uh, the weapon system itself, but the stock and the grips, that tomb guard hand sanded and polyurethane or stained to make them look that way. Um, same thing on every part of the uniform. Um, the belt they wear is cut off of a roll of belt material and then built up to that standard. Uh, the blouses are are pressed and sewn and um, modified to where they look the way they do. The metals racks are built from scratch. So there are certain items like the metals racks, their unit citations, um, that they are able to keep. Um, but as far as profound items that are special to the tomb guards, um, as part of their training process, they're issued a flag early on in training. So once they've passed their first milestone of uh, that evaluation period, uh, they receive a flag, an American flag, uh, similar, oh, not similar, identical to the ones that we plant on um, flags in ceremony throughout Arlington. Uh, and then they take that flag and they layer um, about two rolls of uh, masking tape on the back of it to turn it into essentially a board. Uh, and then from there, on the back of it, uh, if they choose, they can keep track of certain things. Like for me personally, I'm a little OCD, so I keep track of everything that was important to me, like the all the names of the members of my original relief when I started down there, uh, all the dates of when I passed training, uh, like test one, test two, those kind of dates, the date of my first wreath ceremony, uh, and then how many walks I conducted, uh, how many guard changes I conducted, because that was my primary job. Um, other individuals just keep track of simpler things. They just keep track of how many walks they had and maybe uh, the dates they passed training. Um, but as far as items that they, they leave the tomb with, uh, like the, that flag is special to them, and that's pretty much the only memento that they leave the tomb with, aside from a, a plaque that we uh, purchase for every outgoing member to help them kind of remember their, their service down there. And then we also have a, uh, an association, Society of the Honor Guard, um, to the Unknown Soldier, that they um, also help support uh, all former Tomb Guards and Sentinels, uh, things like education scholarships, as well as uh, if a Tomb Guard passes away, uh, they'll do their best to get somebody to be present during the, uh, the funeral. And then they also usually, uh, if it's requested, will provide a uh, Tomb Guard identification badge that can be placed on the headstone as well. Okay. Um, so what sort of thoughts? Um... Have you taken away as, from your time as a guard? Has it affected any other parts of your life um, from, from the experiences that you've had? Oh, without a doubt. Um, so all of us tomb guards go down to the tomb for, for very different reasons. Um, for me, the initial draw was I genuinely wanted to serve with the best soldiers that my current unit uh, had. And from what I had been told and what I had seen, that was the, the tomb guards down there at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Uh, so that's what drew me in. And then experiences like that one where uh, I had that wreath ceremony is kind of what helped me uh, see see training through. That's when it really kind of clicked for me. Um, as far as how that continued to impact me, the day-to-day the -day of like constant high levels of attention to detail and literally within our own creed, our, our mission statement sets out that we are striving for perfection. Like that is our job. Um, we want to be perfect or at least we're striving for that every single day. And that's something that we know is unattainable. Um, but with that in mind, finding a healthy balance of still trying to put that high level of effort through every single day and not letting it negatively impact you, whether you as a soldier, as a leader, or uh, in your family life uh, is very, very very, very powerful kind of mental fortitude that uh, the Tomb Guards have down there. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely kind of carried forth with me as far as the, the discipline it takes. Um, and then, like I said, that, uh, that resilient attitude of striving for perfection every single day and knowing that just because maybe something fell a little short, it's not the end of the world, but now I need to identify this and fix it the next day or do better the next day. That always kind of finding something to improve on attitude. Mm -hmm. Maybe just tell me about, about your experience in the Army. What, what sort of things um, have you learned? I think the, the biggest takeaways I've had in my military career and things I rely on the most are definitely um, 
personal initiative, honestly, uh, and discipline, and not being afraid to take chances or make decisions. Uh, and then, like I said, that accountability uh, piece of wanting to, and that's where the, the tomb kind of plays into the these values and things that we uh, are thinking about when we think about Army soldiers is wanting to always do better, wanting to always do more, um, regardless of what that is, whether it be, like I said, whether you're a cook or you're an infantryman or, or whatever the job may be, always wanting to improve both yourself and the organization that you're a part of. Um, and like I said, taking that, that responsibility for that, um, taking that personal initiative to, if, if all you can control is yourself, then working towards improving that. Um, and then as you move through the ranks, you become a, a non-commissioned officer, or if you're a commissioned officer, understanding that every decision you make, uh, even on a personal level, uh, can have effects uh, on the soldiers around you, and, and wanting to do better, wanting to do better for yourself, but also in order to do better for them, and again, that, that whole bettering your organization, and the whole bettering the Army piece uh, as well. Um, and then that bleeds over into, into every discipline of ours, uh, whether, like I said, whether it be a tomb guard or whether it be uh, competitive marksmanship, um, and especially when you think about things like discipline and mental toughness. Um, it takes a lot of discipline and mental toughness to guard the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier for a 26-hour uh, period. It also takes a lot of mental toughness to take a 20-shot string at 600 yards with the wind blowing 20 miles an hour. <laughs> like, so the, the, the discipline piece for me is, is the biggest one. And um, again, just always doing as much as you can wherever you are. Right, absolutely. What I think is interesting, um, now that you, you have been um, a guard and now also being with the Army Marksmanship Unit is you have this Honor Guard patch on your uniform. At events like our events, you are on the line not just with military members. You are on the line with with juniors and and others who might be looking up to mm -hmm. you. And you have that opportunity to to inspire others. Absolutely, and that especially whenever you think about um, like being in competition. I mean, it's easy to have a bad day, but when you you understand that piece of yes, you have these, especially the juniors, because you're looking at um, both the future of our nation and also the future of uh of this sport or or whatever you want to phrase it as um and these individuals look up or look at these service member teams especially as um as an example so it's it's especially important for us to to demonstrate these values and these attributes um that we think of when we think about the army um because it's it, you see it all the time happen especially on the civilian side where a guy has a, a has a really bad string of fire and they they wear it on their sleeve but uh, as service members um, we especially um, can't do that, um, not so much at camp, but uh, in order to set that good example of being both a, uh, a good, especially being a, a good winner um, and not flaunting it around and not putting people down. But, and that's one thing I especially enjoy about the Army Marksmanship Unit is their, um, their additional piece of the education and training that they provide throughout the marksmanship community of essentially encouraging anyone and everyone, the other services, civilians, to like, here's all the information we have. Like, we want you to come and shoot. We want you to come and outshoot us, honestly. Um, granted, it's our job and our mission to win, but we want to we wanna make that challenging, and we, we want everyone to do as well as they can on any given day. Uh, and we especially don't want people to come out and have a bad time, and we especially don't want that to be as a result of um, us winning and then them seeing us win in a bad way. Um, and that's why it's important, both on the winning side or even if we don't win, not being a bad example for, for all these other shooters out here, including the juniors. Yeah, that's, that's a very important um, part. Um, big, one of the biggest reasons why we have you out here um, and we enjoy having you out here is, is the, the role that you play in the future of, of the generations that are, that are coming up behind you. And uh, especially with our small arms firing school. One of the pieces about AMU that I, I enjoy the most is uh, the training aspect of it for sure. Um, and having these opportunities uh, like we've had throughout the season at different matches to sit there, to train, to coach, uh, because especially even more so here at Perry, because every day you're, you're squatted with new people. 
um, you get out there and you get to talk in and if nothing else is in common, you share shooting in common, we'll talk about that. Um, whether it be what's the wind doing that day or different set equipment setups, things like that, and just sharing experiences. Uh, I think that's really a, a very profound piece of that for AMU that I have definitely really enjoyed, especially like small arms firing school was a blast to, to be a part of this year. Um, and then I wanted to get a little bit too about, uh, your involvement in competitions now with AMU. Um, so you attended our Eastern Games in North right. Carolina. That Was that your first CMP event? In a very long time, yes. I've been to one other, well, somewhat CMP event. I went to, I participated in All Army, um, where they have the EIC matches. That was my first exposure to CMP was military EIC back in 2015. Okay. So it's been a while. Yeah. You're back into it. <laughs> um, how did, how did Eastern, Eastern Games go? It went pretty good. I was actually able to walk away from that match with uh, a few leg points, so that was that was a good match for me for sure. Very cool. And um, I, as I understand it, you, the fact that you are a guard kind of came out when you were on the line talking to the to the um, competitors around mm-hmm. you. Uh, how did they find out about that? Does that just come up in casual conversation, or how did that? <laughs> so uh, so uh, typically, obviously, uh, as service members, uh, the majority of us, uh, especially if we're on some sort of team, we compete in uniform. Um, obviously a way for us to engage with the public and, uh, you know, have that better relationship going on there. Um, but yeah, on my uniform, I've got my tomb guard identification badge and, uh, some people would either not know what it is and ask, or they'd know what it is and engage me in conversation there. But I also typically, as I competed, I've got a, a unit t-shirt that, uh, has a tomb logo on it as well. Um, so that's kind of how they pick me out of the crowd from time to time. Um, not exactly incognito. <laughs> now that and being six five, usually <laughs> people will ask or they'll see my honor guard patch and from the third infantry regiment and ask, I was like, Oh, are you you in the old guard? I'm like, Yeah, that's one of those. Well, what's your job there? And then I tell them I'm at the tomb. That's amazing. What kind of questions. I know you, you kinda of talked about talked about this a little bit from uh, the people who are actually at the tomb and ask you questions. What kind of questions do people on the line or people that you see in passing kinda of have for you about it? Uh, honestly not unlike the questions that, that you just asked. Uh, they they want to know uh what it's like, or they'll ask about any of the, the various uh, rumors that they've heard or things like that. Um, at the end of the day, I just I, I tell them, like, the tomb is guarded by soldiers. They're extremely good soldiers, very disciplined soldiers, but they are Army soldiers. Um, yeah, they're, they're just really good quality individuals that volunteer to go down there, and they put forth an extremely high level of work and discipline every single day. Um, and... Yeah, they're, they're eager, eager to tell the story about uh, the unknowns, why it's important for them to be guarded, why we do what we do, why we try to do it at the level that we do it at. You kind of carry carry the position with you everywhere you go. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's uh, I'm I'm sure that plays a little bit into the part about the Tomb Guard Identification Badge. Um, that's a little fun fact about that is it's the only military award that can be revoked after even after military service. So if I retired, uh, and did something to potentially discredit the organization or bring dishonor to it, uh, I, I could have my Tomb Guard identification badge revoked for that. Um, yeah, so we absolutely take that with us for the rest of our life um, and want to have more people understand what that place is, why it's important, and, and why the guards are even there. Um, so during this conversation right now, we, we're currently at the National Matches. Um, this is your first time to Camp Perry? It is. Uh, and so um, did anyone give you any any tips on what to expect as uh, Camp Perry in general and competing here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've been, like I said, traveling back and forth to a bunch of matches this summer uh, with the, the Army Marksmanship Unit. So I've had those guys uh, huge amounts of support and assistance from all their, uh, all their members. Um, so I was as well prepared as a, a person could be coming into Camp Perry for the first time. Mm-hmm. Were you aware of, uh, before all this, were you aware of Camp Perry in general? Oh, yeah. So once I uh, I was introduced to competition in general back in high school, I shot a three-position air rifle uh, down there in uh, the Muskogee County School District in Georgia uh, for four years. And then once I participated in uh, All Army, it was a part of a little bit larger project that was going on at the 82nd Airborne to where they stood up that essentially a post and station team for the first time and if not ever an extremely long period of time since they had had a post and station team um 
And that's where I was introduced to all that and started hearing about Camp Perry, started hearing about President's 100, Distinguished Badges, things like that. Uh, and then uh, two years after that, actually, uh, a former member of the Army Marksmanship Unit who uh, just uh, retired recently, Sergeant John Wanamaker, me and him were on that uh, 82nd Airborne team together. And about I think it was two years after that team, he ended up getting uh, selected by the AMU and uh, did a summer shooter season with them and then got brought on full time. Um, so he's been somebody I've been in contact with and heard a little bit more about different matches, different uh, disciplines that they shoot in. And uh, um, So how did, how is this trip to Camp Perry? It went pretty good. I mean, longstanding goal of mine was definitely to, to shoot President's 100. Um, shot pretty well and ended up being able to or get it first time. And yeah, I was noticing your, your President's 100 tab on your, on your uniform. Good for you. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm very, very, very happy. It was like I said, it was a longstanding goal to goal of mine is to come here and shoot that that particular match. What was it like being out there and actually living that moment? Nerve wracking, yeah. to say the least. Uh, especially shooting offhand uh, on a less than nice uh, day, as far as the wind condition was concerned for standing. Uh, it was it was very very nerve wracking. Definitely the most match pressure I felt in a match this season. Wow, you made it through. Good job. Um, so uh, after uh, national matches are over, what, what do you where do you go from here? What what do you have planned? Heading back to uh, Virginia, and I'll actually begin my clearing process uh, from the old guard, uh, and then report first or second week of November down to AMU. Cool. So you can stick with AMU for a little bit. Yep, I, I got uh, or got selected uh, earlier this season, and uh, all my orders and everything just recently came through. So I'm starting the process to, to move down there. Good for you. That's very exciting. All right. Any other um, thoughts or anything like that you want to you wanna share with us? Uh, not that I can think of. It's been so much fun um, speaking with you and, and, and finally get to, to, to have this conversation and learn more about you and about the Guard. It's a little, um, this is a, an interesting interview for me because this is the first that I've done in person because we've, uh, you know, we started this podcast over, over the pandemic and, and um, have done everything over the phone. So it's fun actually having a person here. I'm glad you're here. Um, thank you again. Um, appreciate it. And, and good luck to you. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Told you you'd want to hear Sergeant First Class Steel. He's pretty inspiring, huh? We here at the CMP have been so fortunate to welcome so many extraordinary competitors and guests at our events over the years. And Sergeant First Class Steel is certainly one of the most interesting and respectful marksmen that I've ever had the pleasure of speaking with. It certainly seemed like a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'm so grateful to him and the Army for allowing us to interview him and to be able to absorb his story and the story of the hardworking men and women at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Thank you, thank you so much to everyone involved. If you'd like to know more about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, you may visit the Arlington National Cemetery website at arlingtoncemetery.mil. And now that you know a little more about it, be sure to check out the tomb for yourself if you're ever in the D.C. area. You won't regret it. As for Sergeant First Class Deal, keep an eye out for him at CMP and other marksmanship events as he begins his journey with the Army Marksmanship Unit. If you happen to see him, don't be afraid to ask about his time at the tomb. He'd be happy to talk about it with you. Thank you again to Sergeant First Class Deal, and good luck in your new role. We hope to see you soon. And to you, the listeners, thank you again for hanging out with us here on CMP Podcasts. As always, if you'd like to know more about what educational, competitive, or sales events the Civilian Marksmanship Program has going on, which is always something, be sure to visit the CMP website at www.thecmp.org. Until next time, stay safe, everyone. <laughs>